Hello everyone. I hope you can hear me. I'm going to now upload my screen. Just bear with me a minute. You should be able to see my screen and uh, I'm going to make the slides active. Okay. Um, it. It's a great, a, a great honor and pleasure to uh, be invited to talk to you today about uh, evolutionary social science. Um, thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be in Cranfield, but I see that we are not just in Cranfield, we're everywhere in the world from Asia to North America and South America included. And that's wonderful. Uh, one is modern technology. Well, the subject of my talk is how can evolutionary so social science evolve? And you notice I've subtitled it a pessimistic view. I'm not normally a kind of pessimistic person, though I have my time, my, my bouts, but generally optimistic about things in life. But I am pessimistic about progress. I think there's some uh, severe problems with progress in this area, which I'll talk about. But if you can cheer me up and um, give me grounds for optimism and change my view from pessimistic to optimistic, I'll be extremely pleased about that. And um, forever in your debt. Um, this, is, this is a graph, I downloaded some data recently, but I, I, there's previous versions of this being used by myself and others. So in my, um, is there a future for heterodox economics book? I, I reproduce this when we talk about the incidence on the web of science of the word evolution, evolutionary, all such derivatives and so on. Um, this looks very optimistic. Uh, look, this, I mean, even before 2004, there's a very steady growth, growing very much uh, the black line, and also in economics, most of it's economics. And then even more, fan more fantastic is this fantastic surge, for some reason, uh, after 2005 and up to a, a high pl plateau and, and an increasing plateau after that. Um, it's not so optimistic as it looks, but before I go to the key point here, note on the left-hand side, you see the predominance of economics, which is 78% roughly of the total. Uh, the other social sciences like management, business, business finance, uh, took an increasing share, perhaps are going to continue to do so, but political science and sociology, a very low share. So much of the action in terms of the word evolution in social sciences and economics with a lesser uh, but important presence in business and management. Now, I, I did this data, uh, this refreshed data search, and then, I, then I said, well, there's something wrong here. It doesn't look right to me. So what I did then was to take a percentage, and that is to take the whole population that I was looking at searching on the web of science and deflate these figures as percentages. So we get a much less optimistic picture in terms of the incidence of the word evolution and its derivatives. There's no such surge here. It's a steady, uh, um, a steady line, more or less, with a few wobbles. Um, so it's quite misleading to use web and science. I think it's probably because web of science is expanded and jolts. Um, and other different databases do different things, but when you deflate and express as the percentages, the increase is not that great. Well, this is not a huge point, but it's important to note that some of the presentations that myself and others have made uh, are a bit misleading. So it's a bit of self-criticism here to start the ball rolling. Anyway, we're talking about the word evolution. Um, what, it first appeared in English in 1616 in a treatise on, would you believe, military tactics, so not in biology. Um, and its, uh, it's uh, der derivative is from the Latin, uh, from the word volvere, verb volvere. And the word development, likewise, comes from the same source. In French, there's a word roulet, which means to move. You, you, when you when you drive your car, the, 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 the la voiture roule, it moves. Um, so it has a broad meaning of movement um, to unroll or roll. 
um, that connotation. So this is broadly what the term, the etymology of the term is. It was first applied to natural phenomena in 1744 by the German rock biologist Obrecht von Haller. And he used it to describe a process which was widely believed at the time by biologists that the embryo is like a miniature adult and, and it grows into a proper adult gradually through time. So it's an, um, a view of the development of the embryo, which of course we've modified since, but this was used uh, by uh, von Haller to, to describe that process. Another point is that Herbert Spencer, the great 19th century polymath publicist, uh, did more, much more than Darwin to publicize the term evolution. Spencer's works are full of evolution, this evolution, that. Um, in the first edition of The Origin of Species, Darwin didn't use the word, and he wrote evolved only once. He kind of co-opted the word from Spencer when he used it. The point, I'm, apart from that um, historical point, the point I want to make quite strongly now is that in all these contexts that I visited in the last two slides, evolution refers to the development of one thing, okay? It's about one thing unrolling, one thing developing, one thing moving. It's not about populations, it's about one thing. And this is very important because this ambiguity about what we're referring to when we talk about evolution, dogs progress in this whole field. I'm going to make more of that point. If you turn to biology, and I'm not looking historically now, I'm looking as recently as we can, evolution is associated with Darwinism and the evolution of population. So if you talk to biologists and they go evolution, this evolution, that they're talking about populations by and large, maybe with a few exceptions, but certainly in my experience. So if you look to Wikipedia, for example, look up the word evolution, and it says this article is about evolution in biology. In other words, if you want to talk about evolution somewhere else, you find another entry in Wikipedia. And what does it say about this? It says evolution is change in the heritable characteristics of bi biological populations over successive generations. Then gives some references. Oh, okay, so evolution is there in this particular area, this particular context, but it's generally being used in biology to refer to populations. That is a, a, a sum of entities or varied entities in a population. So there's a, a fundamental ambiguity whether evolution is referring to one thing or populations or both. So it could be both because when Darwin talked about populations, he also talked about the, dev the development of individual entities. So populations could include both. So the first conclusion that I'm going to make is trying to establish a single shared clear meaning of evolution in the social sciences will be hopeless. Okay, this is uh, some, some people will disagree with me. They want to say, well, let's all agree on a meaning of evolution and then use it together. But I, I think this is a hopeless task and it's hopeless because of this fundamental difference in the usage of the terms. Does it mean one thing or does it mean a population of things? Um, some, such as Richard Nelson and Sidney Winter, I'll talk about later, in their evolutionary theory of economic change, their classic 1982 book, apply evolution to a population of competing firms with variation and selection. In some respects, they might be unusual in that, but I'll come back to that point. They're certainly an example. Others, such as the evolutionary economist Ulrich Witt and several others, generally apply evolution to the development of single structural order, e.g. through self-organization, without the concept of selection in a population. Okay, this is in the same stable. These are groups of people calling themselves evolutionary economists, publishing in the same journals like the Journal of Evolutionary Economics, but what they mean by evolution is different. Sidney Winter and Richard Nelson have referred to populations, include populations in their uh, scope, and have referred to selection and variation within that population. Ulrich Witt, though, is concerned 
about self-organization without the concept of selection playing a major role in this work. Um, I, I want to say that it's not a disagreement here with Vit and others. So I'm going to say a quick note of agreement. So hopefully this will avoid people questioning on this. So hopefully my position will become clear. Vit, for example, promotes the continuity hypothesis where natural evolution has, to quote him, shaped the ground and still defines the constraints for man-made or cultural evolution. So this is not necessarily biological reductionism. It's simply saying the natural world creates constraints for humans in their, and their activity in the social world, in the economic context and so on. Ulrich Witt also promotes the theory of self-organization, which was de developed by several people, including in biology, Stuart Kaufman, and in uh, economics by Friedrich Hayek and others. They also stress novelty and creativity. Now, I want to make it absolutely clear that I have no disagreement whatsoever in any way with those insights. They're all important. The point is not to say they're wrong, but to say they're insufficient if we turn to populations. So again, we have to be clear what we are talking about. Are we talking about the development of one entity or one structure, or are we talking about a population of entities and structures? If we want to include the latter as well as the former or alongside the former, these ideas which refer to the development of one thing are not sufficient. They're not wrong, they're just insufficient. And actually, there's a quote from Kaufman, which I won't uh, burden the slides with, which says the same thing. Kaufman says that self-organization in biology is not sufficient. We need natural selection as well to sort out those self-organizing forms which are, have greater survival value than others, or greater fitness value than other um, self-organized forms. So it's there in Kaufman. So there's a fundamental ontological dilemma. And option one is to say that evolution mainly refers to the development of single entity or structure involving self-organization or whatever. Proponents of this view can claim its legitimacy through the etymology and early history of the word evolution, as I briefly touched upon a minute or so ago. So they can say, well, this is what it meant. Okay. The option two is, do, does evolution refer to a population of entity structures, including their individual development, with variation and selection, in some sense, in the population, plus replication of some information, passing of information from one entity to another? Proponents of this view can claim its legitimacy through current usage of the word evolution in biology, but we're not talking about biology, so we have to transfer usage in biology to the social domain, and that's difficult. Um, option two, as I've said, includes development in op option one. So option two is actually more inclusive. So arguing about the meaning of evolution, as I said, is going to be a thankless task, but actually when we're addressed, talking about what things we are addressing, reasonably, it will be reasonable to say that we're including both. We're, we're including both the development of individual entities and what happens in whole populations. It's reasonable to include both. That doesn't mean we give them a specific meaning for evolution, it just says that's our object of analysis. So my first conclusion to repeat is to try and establish a single shared and clear, clear meaning of evolution in social sciences would be an unending task. Instead, we have to focus on ontology. What are we analyzing? Okay, Are we including populations in the story? Are we addressing the things that are important in populations, like why is there variation? How does that happen? How is information passed from one to another or retained within particular forms, and why are some in some entities more successful in some sense or other than others? Right? These are relevant questions in populations and their comparative between entities. 
My, my point is it's reasonable to agree that we're talking about both things. It's important to discuss populations as well as single structures or entities. Okay, hopefully I've persuaded you of that point. Now, so when we're talking about uh, populations, we have a number of ways of thinking about it. Um, but there's no doubt that the most prominent conceptual framework for beginning to think about these things, we can discuss whether it's valuable in the long run or what we have to add to it or change about it. But the conceptual triplet, which dominates much of the literature when we're talking about populations, is variation, selection, replication, sometimes with slightly different terms being used, but I'm not going to go into that. Where do these come from? Well, despite their wide usage, some people seem to be reluctant to say that they come from Darwin. And here I must emphasize that Darwin was the originator of this basic conceptual trinity. There is a few glimmers of insight before Darwin, uh, and that these have been established in the literature, but people who have looked at the, the origins of, of Dar Darwinian thinking are generally agreed that Darwin instigated a revolution in thinking, even though there's elements foreshadowed by many other thinkers, thinkers before him. So Darwin, Darwinian thought was revolutionary, and this revolutionary leap is summarized in the briefest possible way by variation, selection, replication. So I say this is a big problem with option two. We have the bogeyman, which is Darwin. Now I'm going to now talk about the bogeyman issue because I think the problem, the reluctance that many people have about talking about Darwinism in a social context comes from several things. And I'm going to briefly summarize what may be those concerns. Okay, this is a, a bit, an art episode here. This is a 1934 fresco by Diego Rivera, Man Control of the Universe. There was an earlier version in New York City, but in the Rockefeller Center, but that's, that was destroyed for political reasons. Uh, of course, Diego Rivera was a great artist. This is a brilliant piece of work. I, I've seen it myself in Mexico City. It's wonderful. Um, it's uh, and I like his work and uh, Frida Kahlo, his wife's as well. But look at this picture more closely. It's a huge fresco. On the right hand side are the goodies. On the left hand side are the baddies. Okay, who are the goodies? Well, it's these Marxists. There's Trotsky, Marx, Engels, Trotsky, J J James Cannon, who was an American Trotskyist. Um, Lenin's there. And we have the proletariat at the top right, uh, and you know, all looking uh, uh, concerned, but uh, giving hope for the future. We move to the left-hand side. What do we have? We have nasty, darker uh, things going on. We have uh, armies with gas masks. We have war. We have gods, religion, and guess who? Darwin down here. Okay, so Darwin's on the bad side. And all the good stuff is on the right-hand side. This is 1934, and this is quite significant. I suggest this, this picture of the relative standing, good and bad, and so on, all the overtones and undertones of what's going on, actually summarizes a lot of thinking in social science since. It's okay to talk about Marx, but not okay to talk about Darwin in social science. In social sciences, not in biology, I'm talking about the social sciences, the D word is much less popular than the E word. It's very easy to prove that. Darwin is wrongly associated with a crude individualism. In fact, if you read The Descent of Man, there's a long, long discussion of human cooperation. I see that uh, David Sloan Wilson is attending, and David has been one of the heroes of showing the, um, the, 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 the good side of the altruistic and cooperative side of Darwinism but in his own work. So, welcome, David. Darwin is also linked to social Darwinism, which is another bogey term. Um, well, first of all, I know that it has several meanings. Uh, so, uh, but there is a problem. Obviously, there were bad ideas associated with biology, which came from biology. So, we have to be warned about that and realize where some of these things can go. So, we take this seriously. So, very, very briefly, what does social Darwinism 
uh, in reparations SD mean? Um, early critics of SD saw it as racist nationalism. Um, I've done a study of the appearance of the term. The term was very rare in the social sciences, at least in the Anglophone world, world, because I've done electronic searches before the 1930s. And the early usage, much of it surrounds the First World War. It appears before then, but in the First World War, it was seen as social Darwinism when the Germans uh, um, um, used nationalistic and racist language to justify their effort in the war. And in fact, the other side probably did the same thing. Um, and this was bemoaned by progressive thinkers at the time. But at that time, um, well, not at the time, but previously, Spencer and Sumner were, we call them as pro-market libertarians these days, individualistic libertarians. They were against nationalism. And they were not described as social Darwinists until the 1930s, long after Spencer was dead. Okay, so um, social Darwinism, Darwinism did not mean Spencer and Sumner until the 1930s. So it changed its meaning. Um, if you don't believe me, again, use do a, do a web search. Okay, does social Darwinism? mean eugenics well whether it did or it didn't uh, there's some arguments on either side of that uh, the fact is that darwin didn't support eugenics uh, there's no statement in darwin when he supports it oh but you say he inspired it well we've all that lots of people have inspired lots of things but darwin did not support eugenics even but there's a statement in the descent of man where he rules out doesn't use the term eugenics but he rules out that kind of conclusion now one of the villains here is talcott parsons who played a role in bringing the term social Darwinism into central discourse in social science. But for him, it means yet something different. It's the application of Darwinian concepts of variation and selection to social evolution. Uh, 37 references, obviously, is his, 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 his classic work on structure, social action. Uh, and he does it in there. Well, if that's the case, if anyone talks about Darwinism, and wants to apply, even in a minimal sense, concepts like variance, variation selection, then according to Parsons, they are social Darwinists. And so, the, again, a very different meaning. It's an analytical uh, uh, definition rather than a uh, normative definition. The, big, the biggest villain, though, in, in creating these new meanings and distortions was uh, Richard Hofstadter in his classic 1944 book, written and published during the Second World War on social Darwinism. And for him, it means a number of things. It means following Parsons, the use of Darwinian concepts in social science, plus racism, which of course is normative, and also competitive individualism. And he thus implicates Spencer and Sumner and underlines the uh, in new inclusion of those two in this uh, uh, gang of people who supposedly promoted social Darwinism. So the point I'm making is it means different things. Its meaning has changed through time, and simply using the phrase social Darwinism um, uh, to, uh, on the understanding or on the belief that it signals one clear view or one particular school of thought is completely undermined by this historical work. Doesn't mean there's not a problem, there is a problem, but we should be careful about the use of terms. Now, I now want to compare with Marx and Engels. Why do I compare with Marx and Engels? For the obvious reason that they made major contributions to social science and they remain hugely influential. They're more influential than Darwin in the social sciences. But I did the statements from Engels, for example, uh, referring to the Slav barbarians, when he says that World War might, might result in the disappearance of the face of Earth of entire reactionary peoples, and that will be a step forward. I mean, that's that's not just racist, that's genocide. And this, this was not in a, a private letter, this was in a, a published article in a, uh, a journal co-edited with Marx. Now, there's, there's lots of uh, racist statements in Marx, so this is one of the worst. Um, I won't even repeat it. It's in a letter, but again, he, he's got other statements of this magnitude. There's a, if you want to read about this, there's an art, a recent article by Eric Van Rie, uh, making sense of the race factor in Marx and Engels' theory of history. 
where he documents several of these cases. Now, my point is not to say, um, well, let, let, we have to throw Marx and Engels in the dustbin too. No, the point is to say, why is this not noticed? We're constantly complaining, or people are constantly complaining about racism, alleged racism in Darwin and social Darwinism, but why don't they complain about uh, 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 such statements in Marx and Engels? Well, you could say, well, many people at the time were racist. Mm, that may be true, but Darwin did not make racist and genocidal statements like those of Marx and Engels. So again, why do we have this resistance to Darwinism and the social sciences? What did Darwin get wrong? He wrongly believed in human races as biological categories. This is largely re rejected by scientists today. Um, Darwin wrongly believed that women were inferior to men. In fact, that's one of his worst crimes, in fact. He clearly says this several times over, and that is something not to be approved of, obviously, clearly wrong. But despite the racism of Marx and Engels, Marxism is much more popular than Darwinism among social scientists. So again, why is there the res resistance to Darwinism? I'm not implying that Marxists are racist, but they may wrongly view Darwin as more racist than Marx or Engels. So we should have a discussion about what everyone said and treat it on the same basis. So same standards for all. We can appreciate the value of Marx's overall contribution without con condoning his racism in any way. Likewise, we can appreciate the value of Keynes's overall contribution without condoning his support for eugenics. As you probably know, eugenics was not just simply a right-wing creed. It was supported by a number of people, including social socialists from H.G. Uh, Wells to Gunnar Muda. Um, we can appreciate the value of Schumpeter's contribution without condoning his alleged anti-Semitism. I say alleged, um, if you do a web search, you can find these allegations. They are reported statements from his time at Harvard. As far as I'm aware, he's not put this in his written work, hence the word alleged. So we have to take those carefully. Uh, but likewise, we should appreciate the value of Darwin's contribution without necessarily condoning social Darwinism, whatever that means. Of course, in some versions, it is bad and we should uh, reject it. In other versions, uh, it means something quite different. And we don't condone his race analysis and we don't support or support eugenics among some of his followers, not him, amongst his followers. In fact, what his followers did is irrelevant. And even if they were inspired by Darwinism, it doesn't mean that Darwin's contribution should be underestimated. We can appreciate it um, as, as a contribution. So we have to separate all these things, for, as we do with Marx and Engels, from uh, these uh, very regrettable statements. Further make conclusions then. Organizing an evolutionary movement in social sciences where evolution is the main organizing term is thwarted with difficulties. Okay, this is my, I'm talking about option two now where we recognize populations where Darwin has made a, a contribution. And the additional con difficulty I found is this resistance because of this baggage associated with Darwinism, which for some reason we don't associate with Marx and Engels and many others. So the only way to move forward on this particular point is, is to deal with these false accusations. So if we're going to make any progress, we have to uh, counter these false accusations against Darwinism um, and, and accept the things that are, are wrong, but not simply ignore it and hope it will go away. Otherwise, people will have this constant resistance to actually considering Darwin, Darwinian principles, whether they're useful or not, in the social context. Okay, the next section is covert Darwinism. Now you see it, now you don't. Back to Nelson and Winter, there's a picture of them receiving some award there, looking very happy. Uh, but both are personal friends of mine, by the way, so I'm not getting at them personally, but I'm going to make a few criticisms, as, you, as you'll see. In their absolutely classic 1982 book, they made no explicit Darwinian connection. First question, why? Especially as their theoretical approach builds on the core Darwinian conceptual triplet, of variation, selection, and inheritance. If you don't believe me, read it. It's quite clear there's mechanisms of variation, 
in a population, there's selection of various things in populations, and there's inheritance of information or transmission of information one thing to another. Call that replication if you wish. For them, for them, there's clearly variation and selection in a population of firms. So Talcott Parsons would call that social Darwinism, wouldn't he? Not very usefully. Okay, but why do Nelson and Winter avoid the Darwinian connection? Okay, and I've asked this question many times. I've not got a clear answer. Um, here's a analysis, a bibliometric analysis in this big diagram. Um, I'm, I'm going to show it twice, so don't worry about the detail for a minute. I'm going to take you through some of the detail. Not all of it will take me hours. But the, the point here is the big mothership. This is the Nelson and Winter book, 1982, the big blue blob in the middle. And the size of the blob is the number of aggregate citations each worker's had. So Schumpeter here, 1942. Um, which is capitalism, social, socialism, and democracy down there. That, that's the number of citations it's got in the Web of Science uh, database, and so on and so forth. So it, the book is clearly remarkably influential in the sense that it's got this larger number of, sense, uh, of, of citations, and it dominates this field. This field is formed by searches on the word evolution and derivatives. Okay. So evolve, evolution, evolutionary, all those things. And that creates the very, very large population that was used by myself and the co-authors to generate this particular uh, a database and to do the analysis on it. So the influence of the book is, is without doubt in that respect. And if, if you want to see the figure, one version of it is in my book, Is There a Future for Heterodox Economics? And there's a chapter there on evolutionary economics. And I'm in part referring to that chapter in this talk. As I say, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so now you see it, now you don't. Nelson and Winter, 1982, in their book, paid repeated homage to Joseph Schumpeter, who incidentally rejected the use of Darwinism and social science. So the they call themselves, they're called by others, neo schumpeterian yet, unlike Schumpeter, they covertly, without describing them as such, use Darwinian principles, variations, selections, and so on. And they ignore Thorstein Veblen, who coined the term evolutionary economics. In 1998, and go is very important, but I haven't got time to go into it here. My point is simply that they raise up Schumpeter and ignore Veblen in their book. They redress the balance a bit later, but this is certainly the case in their book. So, so that's, that's my first case study. That's the Nelson and Winter 1982 book, and I'm going to have a very, very brief sample of other works uh, which tell a, 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 the story as it, as, it, as it goes on. There's a, a seminal article uh, by Peter, these major figures, Peter Merman, Howard Aldrich, uh, da Daniel Leventhal, and Sidney Winter, who wrote on the future of evolutionary research in management and organization theory. Um, very interesting article, recommend it. They stress the importance of empirical work. I totally agree with that. But key concepts are left vague. I mean, incidentally, there's a kind of feeling or expression of, by some of these, uh, uh, by Nelson and Winter, Nelson in particular, actually, is that somehow we just get involved in parable work and the concepts will pop up. But I, I simply don't believe that's true. I, I think it's um, inadequate as a way of organizing empirical research. But in the, the fact that we need empirical research is not disputed. Darwinism is mentioned once, but only in the negative sense in this article, to say that Schumpeter rejected it. So the implication is that Schumpeter rejected it, so we'll reject it as well, without any reason. However, but they go on, the Darwinian concept of selection appears many times in the article, but they fail to give it a clear meaning, which is the second point, which is actually, we all may think that we know what selection means, but there's actually several meanings of what selection means. Uh, this is uh, discussed in detail in joint work by myself and Chilburn Knudsen and others 
uh, particularly in our uh, uh, book Darwin's collection, uh, Conjecture. If you want to look up why selection has different meanings, that's covered in that book. My, my third example is a, a small book by Kurt Dopfer and Jason Potts, and they claimed to have laid out the general theory of economic evolution. Right? So it's economics and social science. They mention more than once the Darwinian triplet of variation, selection, and replication, but there's no mention of Darwin. They don't acknowledge that Darwin actually originated this conceptual triplet and gave it meaning in the context of his theory. There's no discussion of the literature which by then uh, had become quite prominent on generalized Darwinism by myself and others, and of how the general theory of the layout may compare or contrast with it. Um, that the ambiguities and problems like replication, selection, endure in this uh, particular book. So again, it's another example using the variation, selection, replication concepts, but again, not, not uh, uh, giving the Darwin acknowledgement and ignoring the whole Darwinian literature here. Um, my last case is that this book, uh, co-authored by several people, including Kurt Dopfer, Giovanni Dossi, Richard Nelson, Sidney Winter, and several others, is a collection of essays, and it's intended to be an introduction to modern evolutionary economics. And it's a good book. There's, many of the essays are quite inspiring, uh, but my point is, is slightly different. So it's Nelson et al., 2018, Modern Evolutionary Economics. These terms have now disappeared. Selection is mentioned once as an aside. It does not appear in the index. Uh, 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 there's an avoidance rather than a development of the theoretical core. The, the, uh, the, the Darwinian triplet doesn't play any role anywhere in the work. The Darwinian triplet of selection, variation, and replication. And the whole question of developing a general theoretical core is rather pushed to one side. So the book marks a major retreat from the 1982 position of Nelson and Winter, where variation and selection and replication are explicit, and now they're not even there. So Darwinism, covert Darwinism, now you see it, now you don't. You certainly don't see it in this book. Okay, back to, to this figure. Um, the, the green... Uh, markings show clusters, and there's an algorithm to determine clusters. Um, the, the first impression by from looking at this diagram is that evolutionary research, that's simply using these keywords, is highly fragmented. There's some technical stuff down to the bottom of this. This is um, Alpshin and Friedman. There's uh, industrial evolution here as and here is Boyd and Richardson and Axelrod which goes crosses the borders into evolutionary anthropology and also Richard Dawkins another cluster and there's evolutionary game theory with here in this bigger cluster which is the main place in mainstream economics where the evolution world appears these days endogenous growth theory uh, national in innovation systems, which surprisingly is somewhat remote from the rest of it. Now, these bigger clusters around here, uh, this is new economic sociology and organizational colonies, so Hallen and Friedman and all those people. So it's, it's a different discipline. This is largely organization, uh, uh, science and sociology. This cluster here is resource-based and capability-based views. That's TIS and Penrose and Barney and other people. Now, this clutch here is very much around science and March, the classic book. The March book, 1991, is after Nelson and Winter, but the science and March classic 63 book is sometime earlier. There's also Cohen and Leventhal's contribution, 1990. And that's this main cluster to which Nelson and Winter's work more closely relates than any others. But this... Um, is typified not by the general principles of uh, Nelson and Wint Winter's approach, but more by the organizational change, organizational learning, and behavioral uh, approaches. 
And there's other clusters around here. There's Williamson transaction cost economics and so on. So this field is highly fragmented. It's fragmented by disciplinary boundaries and also uh, by uh, other concerns. Uh, science does depend on specialism, so fragmentation should not be surprising. But if we're going to have a trans transfragment discourse or discussion, we have to do something about it. And currently, so-called evolutionary research is highly fragmented. And this lack of connections from this, this larger cluster of clusters to these other things down the bottom. This fragmented conclusion is, conf is confirmed by other studies which have preceded ours. Um, and, and so I, I think this is not is a fairly consensus uh, position. A, a second point, which is just as important, is that the 1980 book, 82 book, does not create its own cluster. It connects very strongly with organizational learning and other things like March and so on, and less so, but importantly, with other things over here and around. But it doesn't create a evolutionary economics cluster of its own, uh, which gen is generating empirical and theoretical work around the Nelson and Winter con concepts. Um, thirdly, major connections to Nelson and Winter are mostly preceding works, not entirely. I've mentioned a couple of exceptions. So, Hence, Nelson and Winter 82 has not led to a cluster of innovation around its key ideas. It's more an inspiration for others who go off and then specialize in their areas. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but it, it does create a problem for spanning research in this area. Um, now, in my book, Is There a Future for Heterodox Economics? I talk about heterodox economics generally in its other, other manifestations. And, and also talk about evolutionary economics. But in both cases, I talk, uh, I use insights from uh, the social epistemology uh, and the sociology uh, and the institutional study of science itself. I'm referring to Robert Merton, Michael Polanyi, Thomas Kuhn, Philip Kitcher, Randall Collins, and several others. Um, and the po one of the points, general points I make in this, this book is that Sciences generally, that's a social and physical sciences, require sufficient pluralism. Without pluralism, they don't move forward. Without pluralism, they don't innovate. So some pluralism, as in a population of rabbits or sheep or anything else, is necessary to create variety, to create innovation. The uh, same is true for science. Plus sufficient consensus based on institutionalized power with authority and incentives to create a shared focus and assert quality control. So if we have just pluralism, there's no incentive to um, take on board others. You simply publish and publish and publish all these various things, and it does, there's no little or no cumulative process because people generally ignore what's said before and try and innovate on their own. So this is a point I think made more, most, most clearly and forcefully by Michael Polanyi in his 1962 article, The Republic of Science. You need authority and incentives to create a shared focus and to assert quality control. Also made by Philip Kitcher. Now this, for evolutionary social science, uh, has serious ramifications. It does for heterodoxy generally, but Confining myself to evolutionary social science, it lacks a single adequate institutional base in academia. It's, it's got little bits of bases in economics, but even those are not really in economics and very often more in management and business schools. In any case, there's no clear organized focus to create the incentives for um, coordinated research with the division of labor and create the conditions for cumulative advance. Okay, so that's, that's a big problem, um, which we can discuss later. I'm now going to conclude. I've got seven points in my conclusion. The first point is the word evolution does not mean very much. And on its own, it's a poor organizing term for focused research on the mechanisms of social change. Second point, 
evolutionary social scientists do not have to agree on what evolution means, but they should agree on some key questions and the meaning of key analytical concepts. So the study of evolving populations, I would suggest, should be part of the shared focus. The study of the evolution of populations is as important as the development of individual entities. Both are important. I'm not downplaying any of those. Fourth, the study of the evolution of populations using the principles of variation, selection, and replication was first developed by Darwin. And, is gen and he generally, he should be acknowledged for this, including in the social science context, despite the baggage of stuff that we have to deal with when we introduce him in this domain. Mistaken resistance to terms such as Darwinism in this context should be actively criticized. Whatever it means, evolutionary social science lacks a home. Most economists in this area have moved outside economics departments, including myself, to business schools, innovation studies, etc. And without more agreement on fundamentals, and without a conducive departmental home in academia, evolutionary social science will remain fragmented and slowly decline. That's my view. But I'd like to thank you for listening and note that any contributions that increase my optimism will be especially appreciated. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you. Um, do you want to turn on your camera if your bandwidth allows that? Yeah, thank you. Fantastic. Uh, well, yeah. Well. I think this is a very sweeping and at the same time very detailed overview of the field and I certainly have lots of questions but um, but I'm also quite keen to let the audience um, pose their questions to you as well so maybe I'll ask one and I'll ask uh, Ibrat to maybe pose one question and then we'll go to the audience if that's okay with you. Um, I have a big kind of sweeping question but I think I'm going to park it for a moment and I'm, I'm going to ask a more specific one. Um, I'm, I was quite intrigued by your comments about um, a number of major works overlooking uh, the discussion uh, or substantive discussion of selection and selection mechanisms. And this is certainly something that I have noticed working with um, kind of evolutionary thinking in management and something that I've also struggled with. And my question for you is, well, what's going on? Why is that the case? Why are we not seeing a good discussion of selection in um, of selection mechanisms in uh, um, in social science? And and how do we conceptualize selection and theorize it? Um, you want me to answer one straight away? Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I pointed, uh, thanks for the question. I, I pointed to, the fact that, first of all, selection is an ambiguous or needs some definition. There's different kinds of selection. Very, very briefly, uh, one concept of selection is where you have a population and some fallout, okay? Um, or alternatively, you take some and some move forward. So this would be artificial selection of pigeons, for example, as Darwin talked about. You would allow some not to breed and then you'll breed from a selective group. So that's what we call subset selection. So you're creating a subset. Um, when some firms die out, you have less firms and you have a subset of what's before. Uh, another form of selection, which is more complicated, some of these ideas come from Price, the biologist, theoretical biologist, is what we call successor selection. And that is generational. So you have generation one and generation two, and there's some meaningful selection process going on. So then we have to this very tricky conceptual problem of defining what that meaningfulness is. So it's something to do with hereditable traits, it's something to do with the environment and the pressure of the environment on them. So it becomes a technical definition now. That's clearly relevant for biology, but it also we would argue it's also relevant for the social world. It's not, we do have such things as business spin-offs, okay? Business spin-offs, so firms being created. In fact, it's more common than people admit or, or aware of, perhaps, of new firms created by teams coming out of the 
the mother parent firm and creating their own firm, which is now a separate uh, organization. That, that's an example of um, <clears throat> successes being created. And, and this could go into a framework we discussed selection. Your, the second point you're raising is, is not just what does selection mean, but what are selection mechanisms, okay? And, and the complexity of these in the social world is just as great as it is in the biological world. So selection operates in different ways. Or, I mean, for example, in the biological world, we have sexual selection, right? which is, uh, again, something Darwin talked about. So male-female competition or selection, peacock's tail, and the whole story, that's uh, one form of selection. Um, and we have other sub-explanations, for example, again, in biology, uh, some male birds are very, have very bright colors or big plumage, whereas some male birds are disguised, like sparrows. They're, they're sort of a lot brownie colors. They hide, they're camouflaged. What's going on? Why the difference? Why the divergence in these different species? Well, in the first case, the bright plumage is because of sexual selection being dominant. In the second case, sex, sex, sexual selection is less dominant and the camouflage effect uh, from predators is more important. So there's huge variation in biology of the kind of mechanism involved, and we, we'd expect just the same in the social world. So the, um, the, we don't have to be slavish about analogies. Uh, um, there's good arguments that some of these things can happen in the social world too, or there's good analogies. But again, we're maybe exploring different stories where there's different kinds of process. So in a business context, there's all sorts of reasons why some firms fail and go out and, and uh, all sorts of reasons why some firms, good or bad, survive. So um, uh, uh, and all sorts of reasons why a firm creates a spin-off, or at least a spin-off is created from a firm and creates new firms. So we have to look at the detail. We have to look, just as Darwin did when he looked at the finches at the Galapagos Islands, you have to look at the detail of the process. It's completely wrong to say this is all theory. It's not. To make the theory work, you have to look at the empirical detail and examine using case studies and so on the particular processes involved. Have you seen much of this work being done in social sciences and maybe in management and economics in particular? Um, I think the, the point that we're trying to make is that um, what, the, what this framework does, it doesn't give you the answers, it poses the questions. I mean, you, you, you're already posing the question, how does selection work in the business or social context? And you're only able to pose that question because we're talking about the same kind of stuff. In population, we're taking on population ontology, we're talking about processes through time where some things survive and others don't, and so on and so forth. So we're in that same theoretical orbit, but and that directs us at the particular empirical and problems of identifying the process. So the theoretical framework is prior to the empirics in that sense. We, we, we Doing the empirics may cause us to revise it. It may cause us to abandon the, the Darwinian triplet. We could go somewhere else. We could say it doesn't work. Uh, or it's too limited, or we need something else. Fine, but you have, first of all have to see if it works by taking it on board and then looking at the empirical examples. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I'm going to pass it over to uh, Ibrat. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, Jeff, um, for the interesting um, overview of the hist historical development, the evolution of the evolution thought. Um, my question is perhaps, I mean, you, you talked a lot about the past. My interest is also about the future. And therefore, where do you see looking forward, you know, where do you see the fruitful avenues for future research, particularly in management and organization studies? Well, I, I think there's a lot of good work going on, right? I think um, on, on organizational adaptation, on uh, generating variety of firms, uh, comparing firms, comparative analysis, there's lots and lots of good empirical and middle level theory, theory going on. Um, what thing? What would help that particular work would be some organizing framework, which creates a positive heuristic that generates new questions. 
rather than everyone doing their own thing and and and, and it was not that that's unimportant but uh, creating more cumulative advance and generating new questions I mean this is the Lacatosian view of a progressive science that it generates new questions and um, one of the problems with a study in business management is it's fragmented, not just in the evolutionary way, but it's fragmented between different disciplines, it's fragmented between different approaches, um, and even within disciplines, some disciplines like sociology, there's enormous fragment fragmentation. So people don't talk to each other enough, and I think they, they should do. And uh, creating theoretical frameworks is, is one way of connecting. And that's really one of the primary purposes here. Thank you, Jeff. Shall we Thank open you. up to the audience, Andre? I think so. Um, so uh, we're going to open it up um, for Q&A um, more generally now. Uh, there are two ways you can pose a question to Jeff. Um, feel free to type it in the chat room if you want. And then either I or, or Ibrat will pick it up. Uh, or uh, if you raise your hand, if you use the Zoom function to raise your hand, um, then perhaps you can do it um, live. Um, and it's always good to have uh, live questions. It's very, uh, allows us to be more interactive. But before I do that, um, there was actually one question that was submitted to us before. Um, so Jeff, I'm going to um, um, read it out to you. Or alternatively, this is a question from uh, Bart Nottingham. And I can see that Bart is on the call. Uh, Bart, would you like to ask that question directly? Uh, you're you're on mute. Sorry. Yeah, you're on Bart. You're on mute. Bart, you're muted. I want to first make another comment. I, in many years, I have tried to apply Darwinian principles in economics, and I came across several problems. And one is the question that I sub submitted, but I would like to first ask another one, and that is that talking about selection, as we just did, my problem is that there's in economics so much co-evolution in the sense that the units to be selected affect the selection conditions. And so this is in, in lobbying by firms, this is an innovation, and if that takes on too strong a form and selection conditions are no longer stable, what remains of selection? What remains of evolution in, in that sense? And now the other question that I did submit was another problem I came across, and that is the mixing up of variety generation and transmission. Transmission in economics is based on communication. In communication, meanings change. Change of meaning is a form of innovation, a form of variety generation. So if these two principles um, uh, get mixed up, what is left of evolutionary logic? So there's actually two questions here. So. Okay, shall I respond? <clears throat> Hi, thanks, Bart, good to see you. Um, the two questions, I mean, First one is that uh, the the entities being selected change the conditions of selection, and there's a feedback process uh, from those conditions onto the selected entity itself. And the second point is the variety, um, uh, the, the transmission process that creates a new variety. Um, and both of those issues appear in biology. So with that, if that is a problem then um, it's a problem for biology too. I will take, for example, the beaver that built, builds a dam. The beaver um, builds dams so it can catch more fish. It changes its own environment. So both the selection of beavers and of fish, for that matter, are affected by the beaver's action. There's in an interaction, as you say, between the entities involved in the population and the selecting environment. It doesn't have to be stable in the natural world, um, and that uh, biologists can cope with talking about this interaction. So I don't see a fundamental pro problem uh, with, about that lack of a stable environment in the social world either. I'd fully take your point that the stable selection environment is of often less uh, 
prevalent, if, if prevalent at all, is much less prevalent in the social world than it is in, in the natural world. But that's a, a relevant point and it must be taken on board. But it doesn't mean that the concept's redundant. And secondly, yes, you're right, um, transmission in the social world is uh, ideas, cognitive ideas, people copying each other's habits and so on. And they, uh, this is much more error prone than genetic transmission. That's true. But genetic tra transmission is not the only mechanism of transmission uh, in the biological world, for, 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 for starters. And certainly in the social world, the kind of er errors created through transmission is, again, doesn't undermine those fundamental pr principles. So I think you're putting your finger on two very important issues, but I, I don't uh, think they undermine the value of those principles in this context. Can I just respond with one comment? I agree with you that they occur in biology also, but it's a matter of degree. And I think that in social systems and economics, it is so much larger that it becomes really problematic. Um, I, I agree it's a problem, and, and the problems are bigger, um, but I, it, I, I'm not convinced that means we have to abandon these principles. I mean, once you have, if, basically, if you're saying that you have an ontology of populations, and there is variety in the population, and there's transmission of information between entities in the population, and there's some kind of selection process carefully defined in that population. If, in other words, some things have more survival probability than others, okay? If that is your ontology, you need an explanation of that variety. How is it generated and sustained? An explanation of that transmission process. And you need a uh, explanation of why selection occurs. And it may be very complicated, but you need those explanations. Otherwise, you can't explain your own ontology. That's all we're yeah. saying. We say this is, you simply need explanations. The Darwinian principles are explanatory requirements. They're not explanations. As, yes, as I, said I, with my, uh, I said in my example, you get different explanations for different things. My examples of birds, sexual selection in one case, camouflage in another. There's different explanations. And we need different explanations in the social world. So these are explanatory requirements. They're not explanations. Yes, well, uh, I'm not saying that we should jettison the, the principles of Darwinism, but that um, if you take, for example, communication as a source of diversity, we should also take on board linguistics. For well, I, I, mean, I, I agree with you. I agree with these, these, these differences, Bob. I agree, absolutely. The, the, the mechanisms in the social world are very, very different. And, and I'm not just saying this for the first time. We say in every one of our published works on this area, we repeat over and over again, the mechanisms are very different. Yes, but how often does this happen, that people cross the boundaries of economics into linguistics and anthropology? Well, you, and you do it and I do it, okay. I mean, more people should do it. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bart. Thank you, Jeff. Um, we have a few more questions in the in the audience, um, and the next one will pick up from one of my colleagues at Cranfield, uh, Will Lewis. Will. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much, Jeffrey. That was a great talk. Uh, I have a couple of questions that are more less of a challenge, more just kind of exploratory really. Um, the first uh, relates back to your slide that, uh, with the artistic work. Uh, the If I remember the, the universe, is that, can you hear me? Says my- We're sort of, sort of losing you, Will. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, a bit of a thunderstorm going on over here. Uh, the 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 idea of man being at the centre of the universe and in control was that the gist there of the centre? No. no, not on the point. No. Okay. Well, well, where I was going with that was uh, not the main point, but arguing that was this this fresco and, and everyone involved in the fresco arguably viewing this entire problematic through a Newtonian clockwork universe perspective and have the advancements in our understanding of physics since those 
epochs of or epistemes, as Foucault might call them, of knowledge, uh, have they been taken on within this problematic or not? Uh, and the second is around the discussion you've been having around selection processes. Uh, Darwin, for Darwin, arguably it's the environment that selects. The, the species are passively subject to environmental shifts and aren't really in control of the process. Um, whereas arguably the whole nature and, uh, and uh, ethos of strategic management is having some kind of uh, control, some kind of steering of the process. So might we consider there for the resource-based view of these approaches to strategy being perhaps more Lamarckian in nature it, it, rather than Darwinian? And is there perhaps there a blurring of how selection processes mm. are theorized and framed within the field? And is it perhaps the Lamarckian aspect that we could more trace back to social Darwinism and Spencer? Thank you. Okay, thank, thanks very much for that question. Um, on the Rivera painting, I, I, I'm not, not defending his view of the universe, whatever that was. I mean, he was a Marxist. I mean, I don't know if he wrote anything about physics or whatever. So I, 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 wouldn't, I couldn't defend it because I'm not aware of it. But the point I used, uh, made using that uh, mural, fresco, was that there's a good side and a bad side. So as you saw the picture, the goodies are on the right and the bad is on the left. The goodies are the Marxists, Lenin, Trotsky, and all the others. And on the left, the bad is there's religion, God, war, and Darwin, okay? So Darwin is one of the baddies. In fact, he's right over on the left. He's one of the baddest of the baddies. And that's the point I'm making with the Rivera painting. That is a prevalent view which emerged from the 1930s, or 30s onwards. Okay, secondly, perhaps more importantly, your point about the um, nature of Darwinism. You're absolutely right. The intentionality and strategy is vital to, to um, understanding what, uh, firm strategy, understanding how business works, and so on. I, I sadly went before she died. I was a, a, uh, a I developed a friend, friendship with Edith Penrose, who was one of the pioneers of the uh, resource-based theory of the firm, and she published a, fa a famous paper in the 19, early 1950s, where she criticised Armin Alkin. Armin Alkin was one of the early in the post-war period, one of the first people in the post-war period to introduce evolutionary concepts in economics and business. And Edith Penrose published a little note which she said this is wrong because the, uh, Darwinism is passive, uh, there's intentionality, there's strategy, and firms are thus, and therefore this framework is wrong. Okay, I, I, I got to know Edith Penrose sufficiently well to discuss her work at length, and she says now she was wrong. The reason why she was wrong is that Darwinism is not passive. Okay, that the Darwinian framework actually doesn't say that. A lot of people say, well, Darwinism means uh, um, a passive environment and random mutations uh, and so on and so forth, creating variation. Um, Darwin never mentions random mutations. He never mentions mutations and he never mentions randomness. He says we don't know the cause of variation. He didn't, was unaware of genetic, but he actually accepted the possibility that intentionality was relevant to that particular story. So human strategic purpose and intention is relevant. The whole load, there's shed loads of stuff in Darwin, in both the origin of species and in the descent of man, which talk about the evolution of human cognition and intentionality. He's treating human actors as not as passive things that react to the environment, and uh, it's saying humans in particular can engage and change their environments. They think about, they appraise their circumstances and they act accordingly. Where did we get that from? It didn't suddenly come from up high or from God or anywhere. It must have evolved stage by stage from previous animals. So animals before us, the primates from which we are descended, also had some capacity to deliberate and so on. So this... Um, view of what Darwinism is, is just completely wrong, okay? I, I, um, it doesn't correspond to what Darwin said. It's a version of Darwinism, which was prominent in the 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s, but 
no longer um, really has, has prevalence. But that the nuances are so 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 uh, uh, so many additional nuances have been brought in that um, we can now accommodate a very rich picture of strategic agency within the Darwin, Darwinian framework. Well, thank you. I guess just to pull those together, I guess my point was that if we abandon Newtonian understanding of the universe, can we, in a Mintzbergian sense, predetermine what characteristics we should be investing in in our resource-based view to show intentionality, to try and preempt necessary adaptations? Um, yeah, I mean, it's not just abandoning a Newtonian view, it's actually abandoning an Aristotelian view. And there's a good philosophical literature on this point, is that Darwin actually was a very, it was a great philosopher. I mean, he wasn't trained as a philosopher and he didn't write very much as a philosopher, apart from in, in, his, in his unpublished notebooks. And what he was doing was breaking from the Aristotelian view of variety. I mean, Aristotelian view of variety is that variety is deviation from one natural form, okay? Which is an approximation you, people make in physics sometimes. You, you have little variations, but we just take a particle as an abstraction, so it which copes with everything for the particular purpose that we're going to analyze, analyze. But Darwin broke fundamentally from that. He said that deviations or variation is not simply variation from an average or modal form, it is the fuel of evolutionary progress. So the ontology switches fundamentally. It's, uh, and, it, and it's a break from Aristotelianism, uh, which would include uh, elements of Newtonian in physics as well. But um, the whole, as you appreciate, the whole thing about the relationship between physics and biology is very different. But th there's a group of philosophers, including Lawrence Mayer, that say Darwin's view is fundamentally different philosophically from much that went before in the physical tradition, including you. Mm. Agreed, yeah, and, and I won't, I'll, I'll finish there. Right, but yeah, uh, I'm, I'm currently reading Henry Bergson's Creative Evolution for, for an alternative yeah. way through. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Jeff. Um, we've got a flow of questions, uh, which is what Ebert is telling me. Um, not everyone can raise their hands. So we're going to go David, Brian, Torbjorn, and Adriano. Okay, well, Jeffrey, my mission in life is to infuse you with new optimism here. <laughs> uh, and uh, I think the point that I want to make just to fill out your social history with the history of evolutionary biology is how much my field of evolutionary biology was constricted to the study of genetic evolution for most of the 20th century, leaving out anything that could be called cultural and so on and so forth, what's most relevant to the social sciences. And that did not change, as you know, Jeff, and many others here, until the closing decades of the 20th century. So uh, the 1980s, when, when Nelson and Winter coined the term evolutionary economics, that's when terms like evolutionary psychology, evolutionary anthropology were also formed, signaling the need to rethink whole disciplines in the social sciences from an evolutionary perspective. The point being is that if we want to approach economics or management or business or any other topic uh, from an evolutionary perspective, we're gonna to need to rely on developments that are only took place during the last 10, 20 years or 30 years, you could call it a kind of a new, um, a new beginning. And, and that has to take place, of course, in, in the background of you know, the complexities of the, of, the more distant, um, of the more distant past. So I think that when we do that, which of course is what I'm um, all about, uh, there can be more optimism that based on, on, um, on the developments of the last few decades, including enormous emphasis on symbolic thought for example, just to pick one example, multi-level selection. We need to note that evolutionary biology itself became individualistic, just like orthodox economics during its selfish gene era and so on and so forth. It goes on and on. But a final point, keeping it short, in a policy sense, what this boils down to is a form of artificial cultural selection. We need to form policy goals, as 
the targets of collection, variation around the target, and replicate better practices, um, are realizing that they'll be sensitive to context. This is like what we need to do in a policy sense is to create a, a managed process of cultural evolution, more mindful than, than ever before, which is how it can be kind of brought into practical framework. So uh, that's um, obviously a very short piece. I expect your answer to be short to give time to other, um, other questions, but uh, I do feel that there's uh, like a new beginning to the study of, um, of, of the social sciences from an evolutionary perspective. Yeah, thanks, David. And it's great to see you. And also, I will underline that your contribution to what's happened in the last 30 years has been huge. Um, your, your work on group selection and also your more recent work on uh, policy, economic and social policy, and the Norway project and all that stuff has been fantastic. And if anyone's going to make you optimistic, it's probably going to be you. But um, maybe there's a, a bit of a struggle ahead. But I, I, I do. Um, um, uh, I, I do actually uh, th see you're absolutely right that much of the change has occurred within the last 30 years. But my final sentence in response to that would be, that doesn't explain the now you see it, now you don't thing with Nelson and Winter and the, the retreat. And, and, and this is really, uh, I was really quite um, sad to read that book and see no mention of these issues. Whereas previously they've been hidden under the various variation selection inheritance triplet they know disappear. Um, and Nelson now says, Dick Nelson says, he's a friend of mine, so I'm not being personal here, but he says, oh, we're making progress because everything is evolutionary. Well, yeah, evolution is so, defined so vaguely that everything is evolutionary. If we're talking about change, it's evolutionary. It doesn't show uh, progress on this theoretical uh, core addressing the evolution of populations. But thanks anyway, and it's great to see you. Thank you. Um, Brian. There. there, I've unmuted myself. Um, right. Thanks, Jeff, and you, you'll, you'll know where I'm coming from with this question. Um, I share your pessimism about the slow progress of generalized Darwinism. Um, so here's my question. But the premise to my question is in, in I see some hope in borrowing concepts from medicine. So in my field in medicine and biology, there's a strongly established, very valued area of translational research in which fundamental ideas and basic science are translated into practical application. And importantly, that practical application, say in, in areas like drug development, then feeds back into basic research in a kind of positive feedback loop. Um, it's it, it, it's like I was taught when I did my PhD at Cranfield, it's like Gibbons type through knowledge generation in a sense. So my question is, what potential do you think exists for corresponding research which translates fundamental generalized Darwinism work like yours into practice in applied social sciences, such as management, and then helps loop back into informing theory. And if you do think there's potential for that, then how might we, how might it be encouraged either in business schools or in commercial institutions? Uh, great, great, Brian, thanks very much for that question. I, I, I very much admire your work on, on, on this area. A uh, number, number of books, and I think I recommend them to everyone to talk about the way in which you use uh, Darwinian and evolutionary principles and apply them to particular phenomena, particularly the evolution of uh, big pharmaceutical companies and their, their practices. I, I think that's the kind of way to go in terms of showing, demonstrating the empirical relevance. Uh, when Darwin Develop, uh, published the uh, Origin of Species in 1859. It took decade after decade of people researching on, on specific areas to reinforce the argument. Um, so we need two things. We need people to take the argument seriously and not dismiss it with wrong criticisms and, and with prejudice and so on. Take it on one, maybe park it on the side and not get too obsessed with the technical details or the concepts but deploy the basic framework in empirically specific areas. And you're doing great work in that area, and I think that's the way to continue. And you're not afraid to use the D word when necessary. 
So I, I think you're you're being an exemplar of the way forward, uh, Brian, in your work. So thanks for that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to go to Thornbjorn. Thank you, and uh, thanks, Jeff, for a strong talk here. It was beautiful. Um, it convincingly uh, uh, reinforced the pessimistic view, also that I, I hold. But an observation is the major hole, per also your cluster analysis, is in strategy management and organization science. Now, that, that field broadly spoken have two foci. One is adaptation. Naturally, strategy is interested in, in helping managers understand and improve uh, the ways of the firm so that it can have success. So there's not much interest in strategy per se uh, because of, of the adaptation uh, problem uh, being pre uh, predominant. The other observation is the time scale that we're interested in in strategy, I speak as a strategy organization scholar now, uh, are short. So uh, that is uh, an additional reason. I'm not in any way disputing the reasons you, I completely agree with, with everything you said here, an additional reason. Now, here's the clinch. This actually perhaps exactly the right point in time to, to share this strong pessimistic view because I side with David Sloan Wilson in, in actually thinking this is exactly the point, time, a point in time for a new beginning. Why? Because I see uh, growing interest in population dynamics in the field of organization, science, in the field of management and so on. Why? For, for various reasons. I'm, and I'm not going to, to spend time on a lot of them, but one is uh, AI's artificial intelligence. They have speeded up uh, timescales in, in, in social systems. Also, they have put the notion of selection, at least in a very primitive sense, uh, on the agenda very clearly. So, and a third reason is there's an increasing amount of data that actually cover population dynamics over sufficient uh, timescales. So for these reasons, I think um, a new beginning, a cautious optimism uh, for a new turn. And the last thing is the supply side, us, you and I and our colleagues, Jeff, we have an extremely strong offer. There have been no takers. So I've been asking, really, really, why not? You know, And uh, I believe there will be an increasing need for an overarching framework within which we can, we can uh, situate our explorations of these, uh, this, these new developments. So that was sort of a comment, uh, not really a challenge, uh, if any chance, it should be to the endurance of your pessimism. Thank you. So, thanks very much, Chirwan. Great to see you. Um, I, I think your, your your little bit of optimism is slightly infectious. <laughs> the, 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 th the things you mentioned actually do give one a little bit of hope. And along the points that David Sloan Wilson made about uh, work on cultural evolution and so on. But the things you mentioned, I think, are, are, are exciting and they're also moving, a moving frontier. And, and your point about um, data analysis, big data, is, is, is really important too. So thanks for that. Thank you. Um, there's another question in the audience. And then if you're happy to take more questions, Jeff, uh, we'll pick up a couple of questions from the chat room as well. Uh, but we'll go to Eric. Hi, Jeff. Um, well, first, uh, uh, thank you for a terrific uh, talk. I very much agree with your analysis, uh, if not with your pessimism. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and the, the reason why I, I remain uh, optimistic is that um, uh, just as a scientific proposition, you know, the fact that the, the low entropy and energy flows of 
complex systems like the economy and other social systems, evolution is the only mechanism we know that can produce those patterns. You know, and, and I, I you know, stand behind that as a scientific statement. So, you know, then the question is, you know, that it, it has to be an evolutionary system. You know, there isn't necessarily an alternative, but what we have failed to do is articulate the kind of the how of that evolutionary system in a scientifically robust way with some consensus and institutional homes and all the other things that you, you've described. So then the, then the question is, almost a methodological one, you know, what, what does a scientific program that produces testable hypotheses, uses data models, you know, falsification, add some rigor to the field, you know, look like that could do that? Because, um, and I'm not saying it all has to be quantitative, you know, uh, you know, good biology and the type of work someone like David Stone Wilson has done, you know, mixes the quantitative and empirical and narrative and other things. And we probably need multiple methods like that as well. But, um, you know, how do we kind of kick the field out of, to be blunt, a lot of philosophizing and navel gazing <laughs> into, you know, a, a scientific program that will then get that external acceptance that I think we've all wanted. Great, thanks, thanks, Eric. Uh, it's good to see you, and also I, I should put a plug in for your great work in this area too. Uh, thanks for that. I I, I share your jaw-dropping uh, um, amazement about the power of Darwinian evolutionary thinking, and the way it opens up a whole new way of seeing the world, not simply in terms of the descent of man and so on, but about understanding causal processes of understanding complexity, of understanding the generation of variety, understanding qualitative as well as quantitative change through time. All, all these things are brought in by this, this huge paradigm shift which occurred in the middle of the 19th century. And I, I share your amazement about that. It doesn't cease to amaze me. And uh, that's why, you know, that, that is our basis, rock solid optimism that the, whatever happens, you know, the, this vision, this view of life to use Darwin's uh, phrase, ain't gonna go away, right? And, and the problem we've got to do is convince social scientists that the view, this view of life is not just about biology, it's also about, as David Sloan Wilson said, about cultural transmission, it's about institutional change, it's about routines, it's about all these other things as well, uh, knowledge is a very strong concept in your work, and so on and so forth. My worry is my point about an institutional home in academia for this. Where does it go? Interdisciplinary work is not easy. It's very hard. The, only, the best example I can think of of a successful interdisciplinary in, 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 endeavor in recent years, at least in academia, is Institutes of Innovation Studies which didn't exist 40 years ago, or they were called something different, social studies and science or something like that. And they're now, uh, grown, they've grown, now grown and become very influential and got huge grant money and so on. Um, that, 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 that's the best model I can think of it, of interdisciplinary um, endeavor. And we won't get anything on that scale or success, but we should actually start pushing some kind of interdisciplinary uh, structure to house this stuff. Uh, otherwise, we will be in our separate silos. I'm a bit pessimistic about business schools. There's more pessimism uh, because business schools are more and more getting like American business schools. And American business schools, my impression is, they become subject specialist. So the economists publish in the AR or the QQG, and the uh, strategic strategy people publish in the Strategic Management Journal. And they're all in their separate silos, and they're brought in to do these composite courses where there's a strategy element and an economics element and such and such. And, and so I think the way business goals are slowly evolving in Europe, more like the American model, is, a, is not necessarily a good home, at least a few decades down the line. So, yeah, I, I'm agreeing with what, what you say, uh, um, but adding a little bit of concern about the institutional home. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so we're sort of at the end of the 90 minutes that we planned for, but if you're happy to take a couple more questions, we'll... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Ibra, do we have something from the chat room? 
No, I don't think so, Andre. I think everyone uh, who posts a question in the chat also then asks the questions directly. Um, well, actually, there was a question in the beginning. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to read it out. Um, uh, if I haven't lost it, I must have lost it now. I think you've been watching it more carefully, Brad. So if there is nothing, um, yeah, cool. Um, in any case, Jeff, uh, what we'll do is we will um, we will collect all of the comments and questions uh, in the chat room, edit them, and and have and let you have the transcript as well, just for your information as well. But Thank um, you. we usually end these um, uh, these talks with three very quick questions that we pose to all of our guests. Um, and so my first question is, um, who do you think is doing interesting work in this space? Um, and uh, you already uh, you already mentioned a couple of people who are already on the call, but who else? Who else? Uh, I, I started writing down some names. I mean, uh, Present company accepted, you know, I've mentioned that the, all the people have been on the call. Dermot Breslin, I think, is left, but he's done some great work in this area too. I don't think Jan Willem Stoolhoss is, on on, is, is, is connected, but he's done some really excellent work. I'm, I must admit, there's a kind of um, bias. Um, I, I'm back, my background is mathematics and philosophy, and then I gravitated through economics towards management and business. But, so I, I'm quite interested in the philosophical stuff, but I, I do think the people like Dan Leventhal, who are doing really important empirically, empirical work on organizational adaptation are also tremendously important. I only wish that people like Dan Leventhal would connect up more with, with the, uh, more, the more abstract discussion uh, which we've been having today and the conceptual issues which must remain, must remain central. So there's, there's a large number of names. So, there, I mean, there's, re, there, there's a lot of excellent work being done. David Sloan Wilson is, is absolutely right that what's happened in the last 30 years is really quite amazing in several areas. And it's it's not going away, but the trouble is it's not connected. We need to connect it up and, and uh, talk about a, a developing a paradigm. That's a really hard work, I think. Pardon my okay, thing. Thank you. Uh, my second question is slightly um, slightly bigger in scope. Um, and if you could if you could think of uh, maybe one or two kind of formative um, readings or formative um, pieces of material that formed your view in this um, in this space, what well, what were they? What would that be? Oh, again, that's a hard question. I think the I mean I read Darwin, but then I reread it. So I mean. The, it, Darwin was a revelation, particularly the descent of man, uh, because he talks about group selection and social evolution there. And I read that once and I reread it and then reread it. I'm constantly going back to it. It's extremely rich. Some of it's a bit wrong. Uh, it has to be adapted and it has to be more rigorous in some ways. So that, that's important. Um, but again, from my philosophical background, it's people like Ernst Mayer. Who, who the great interpreter, mid 20th century interpreters, or second half 20th century interpreters, uh, philosophers of biology. It's, it goes back to another question about the difference between the physics based paradigm and the biology based paradigm. It's understanding that difference. And the, one of the key concepts, according to Ernst Mayer, is what he calls population thinking. Um, so the discussion around there is, is very good. But I mean, outside that field, I mean, Nelson and Winter is an inspiration too, despite what I said about them. Um, the, the, their, their work is, uh, was uh, pathbreaking and uh, had a huge impact, as I've hopefully demonstrated with that diagram. And, and, and others, uh, our, our work by them is also important. So it's a number of things. Thank um, you. That inspired me. And maybe final, very maybe very easy question. So, what are you reading now? What's on your desk now? Okay, well, I, um, I, I'm working on a couple of projects, but the one that's interesting me and keeping me going, and it is related, is on economic history. I've got more and more interested in economic history, and there's a nagging question in my back: is that the stuff I'm talking about? 
talking about the origins of capitalism, basically, and particularly in the English context. Does Darwinism fit? Okay, because there's a very interesting story about the origins of the capitalism, which we haven't got time to discuss. But uh, the question, does Darwinism fit? Is it a selection process? And in which case, what does it mean to say that? A dog in me. So perhaps if you ask me in a couple of years' time, I'll come back with a different story. But um, I, I, I'm trying to apply some general principles concerning change and concerning understanding of institutional change, institutional evolution, using the stuff we've been discussing today and also some other material by, by other people to understand uh, the, the basis of economic development, the, the preconditions of economic development. And I, I, I'm an evolutionary social scientist, but I'm also an institutional social scientist. So as you probably know from my CV that I've done a lot of work on institutions and that's still very much uh, my concern too. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. And just a final comment. Uh, while you were speaking, Brian suggested uh, your chapter, Evolutionary Economics, Its Nature and Future, as a great reading in the field. Um, but I just want to end by thanking you again for joining us here at Cranfield um, and for fielding questions for almost an hour. Um, this was a fantastic webinar and a great end to our uh, spring session. Thank you very much. And thank you, Ibrat, for being here as well.